Now, when uh, we take uh, drugs and other symptom suppressing uh, treatments, the garbage gets or the waste gets trapped inside the body and it really starts to pile up. And yeah, we're still caught in the danger zone where damage is now beginning to occur. Now this damage now manifests in what we call a chronic disease. And chronic disease is no longer a body instituted process aimed at quickly removing toxins, but rather represents the manifestation of actual organic damage. And there you have it, we have red hot rheumatic joints, psoriasis, lupus and other skin lesions, inflammatory bowel diseases, and other autoimmune diseases, uh, you name it. And at the very end stage of this process, when the cells are completely bathed in waste and toxic matter, and begin to, they begin to mutate, and they no longer replicate in the proper manner. This then, the very end stage of disease, is what we call cancer. Now the name of the chronic disease is irrelevant. The diagnosis is really only a name for a collection of symptoms. And now you and I are smarter than that, right? We know that if we're, we're going to address an effect, we must first identify and address its cause. You can't stop your hand from burning on a hot stove if you first don't remove your hand, right? To try to suppress a disease or cure it without removing its cause is akin to treating a burning hand without taking it out of the, uh, off the stove or out of the fire. Or, better yet, trying to cure a drunk while he continues to drink. So, what then are the fundamental causes of disease? And as I'm sure you now know, uh, innervation or being in a state of energy debt and toxemia or a buildup of wastes. So let's summarize what we've done so far. When we're in a state of energy debt, the Department of Sanitation suffers. And when the department suffers, garbage accumulates. When garbage accumulates and exceeds the body's threshold point, the body creates a sickness to quickly eliminate waste and bring it back down to safe levels. If we allow the body to do its work, the level of waste will quickly drop and the body will once again return to normal function. The danger will be averted and better health will result. But if we interfere with the body's work and choose to place trust in symptom suppressing treatments rather than the body's innate healing powers, then we are headed down a road that leads to nothing but sickness and suffering. So, now that we understand the fundamental causes of disease, how can we begin to address them? Well, let's begin to identify the more common ways in which we continually innervate or exhaust the body's vitality. Remember, this is the number one cause of disease. Now, a lack of sleep is the surest way to end up in energy debt. If you don't sleep, you won't produce any vital energy in the first place. Stress, emotional and mental, also greatly fatigues the body. Have you ever been completely overwhelmed by fear, anger or anxiety only to find yourself completely exhausted once the crisis was resolved? This is because it takes a tremendous amount of vitality to deal with these kind of stresses. Overeating is another common cause of innervation. Remember, it takes a tremendous amount of vitality to process food. It was number one on our list as far as energy demands go. When we continuously put food into the system unnecessarily, our body's energy resources quickly become depleted, and then as a result, the Department of Sanitation will begin to suffer as a result of uh, energy debt. Exercise itself requires a lot of energy. Over-exercising is another common cause of innervation, um, but highly misunderstood. Exercise is a catabolic process, which means it breaks the body down. Healing and recovery is also energy expensive, further depleting the system. Now, I'm not saying exercise is bad for you, but what I am saying is that we must first be sure that we have the energy to perform it in the first place and be very careful not to push ourselves to the brink and overdo it. Let's look at some of the more common causes of the second cause of disease, uh, toxemia or a buildup of waste. Now, the body is continuously producing metabolic waste, so that's a given. Let's instead focus on the ways in which we consciously poison ourselves from outside in. Now these may include pesticides, polluted air, polluted water, chemicals, uh, food additives, alcohol and tobacco, prescription and over-the-counter medications, poor food choices, caffeine, vaccines, radiation, just to name a few. Now remember, the body deals with waste all the time. We um, 
we run into trouble when the amount of waste exceeds the rate at which the body can process and remove it. Now, the process requires abundant energy, which is why the single biggest cause of toxemia, other than outright poisoning, of course, is being in a state of innervation or exhaustion. Now that you understand the basic causes of disease, go ahead and make your own list. Identify the ways in which you unnecessarily waste your vital energy or not produce it in the first place and continuously burden the system with added waste or toxic products. Do your best to identify and address these causes and see what you can do to eliminate them. Alright, so let's head back to our definition of natural hygiene and take a look at the second half of the story, creating the proper conditions for healing to occur. Once the causes of disease have been identified and addressed, we must then work to provide the proper environment for the body to most effectively heal itself. Let's make use of a simple analogy to demonstrate this point. Here we have a nice picture of a garden someone constructed in their yard. We've got a few rows of plants here in a nice sized plot. Now if we want our garden to thrive and our plants to be strong and healthy, we must provide the proper conditions for that to occur. Each plant species uh, that we have in our garden will thrive under a specific set of conditions. Each must have the proper soil nutrition, the proper amount of sunlight, um, the proper amount of care and attention, the proper temperature for example, and the proper protection of course. The amounts of each will vary according to the type of the plant and we must do our best to identify and apply each in the right amount. If we fail to provide the proper conditions, our plants and our garden will begin to wilt and die. Now this concept applies not only to the plants of this world, but to all organisms for that matter. Plants, dogs, and people for example, each thrive under a specific set of ideal conditions. So here's the take home point. The human body, and all organisms on this planet for that matter, are self-healing and self-regulating, but, now for the fine print, only under the right conditions. So back to our definition of uh, natural hygiene, and our natural hygiene seeks to understand and address the causes of disease, and then apply the conditions of health in order to preserve health when we have it and restore health when we have lost it. Those influences that have a positive effect on the human body include pure air, pure water, whole, predominantly raw foods, sunlight exposure, good and good social influences, proper exercise in the right amount, companionship and love, emotional poise and peace, and I'm sure you can think of more, the list goes on and on. And when the proper conditions for health are provided at the right time and in the right amount, the body's innate healing potential will then become a reality. In taking a hygienic approach to health, we must first identify the causes of disease, address them, and then provide the optimal conditions for health. Keep in mind, though, that we are all different. Each one of us is extraordinarily unique, and it's not enough to merely assign a diagnosis and treat everyone as if they were the same. We're all individuals from a genetic standpoint, a biochemical standpoint, and an environmental standpoint. Each one of us has needs all our own. The causes of disease are different for different people, even if they have been given the same diagnosis. We must work to apply the hygienic principles we learned today in a way that takes this individuality into account. At the Goldberg Clinic, for example, we routinely see patients with rheumatoid arthritis and I'm amazed at how, how different and unique each case is from the next. And this applies to almost any condition for that matter. In a clinical setting, it is essential to find a practitioner that will take the time necessary to identify the unique causes of a particular health impairment, not by focusing on the diagnosis per se, but rather through by taking a thorough history, a physical exam, and by ordering functional and standard laboratory testing as needed. At the Goldberg Clinic, our motto is, causes identified, causes addressed, health restored. We do not offer treatments for disease, but instead work to bring out the healing powers within. We work with you in creating an individualized program suited to your needs, aimed at addressing the causes of impairment and creating the right conditions for your body to then begin the healing process. 
What's good for one person is not always good for another. And at the Goldberg Clinic, we appreciate the uniqueness of your situation and work diligently towards putting you on the path to restored health. For more information, visit the Goldberg Clinic at www.goldbergclinic.com. It was a pleasure teaching you today, and I wish you the very best on your quest for better health.